Hey, what up, everyone? It's Julio with Small Camera Big Picture. Today, I've got Joseph Ellis out of Dallas, Texas. So, briefly, Joe, you go by Joe, right? Sure, yep. Okay, cool. Kind of like I'm Julio, but I go by G. And sometimes, <laughs> hey, hey, you, yeah, hey, right. hey, can I get out of my way? <laughs> I respond to those two. But So, Joe is a professional wedding and portrait photographer in Dallas. He's really good. Uh he is a YouTuber, and that's how I found him through his YouTube channel, which covers a lot of cool photography topics, including uh, what I was searching for at the time, which was stuff related to Olympus. He's also husband, father, active at all those things, which I've picked up quite well um, based on uh, your online presence. And he seemed like an all-around pretty rad dude because you're here, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming on. So I got um, some cool stuff to chat about. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited because I, um, I've been shooting mirrorless since 2011. And that was micro four thirds at the time. And uh, back then, I was just kind of like, even like, even uh, an ad, an ad agency that I was working with that worked for Olympus were like, so you actually use the cameras and... <laughs> for like right. assignments. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I shot a magazine cover with the pen mini. They're like, Oh, you know, they, they had no idea. And I'm like, dude, it's totally capable. So anyways, um, definitely want to talk to you about that. Cause now it's like, we find, I find a lot more people that use the system and it's not necessarily that they're gearheads it's more so like, Hey, this is really cool. I can do some cool stuff. It helps me in certain ways and I am having fun doing it. So I'm like, that's, that, that it's amazing, right? I mean, to, to have uh, these tools. So um, I want to talk to you a lot about wedding photography because I don't know a whole lot about it. I've done my weddings, but it's more so like, I don't know anybody who shoots. Oh, I know somebody. It's my cousin's friend or something. <laughs> and I'm like, they're like, oh, you, you take pictures on portraits and street and all that. You must be a wedding photographer. So um how, how did you get into weddings specifically? Sure. Well, um, years and years ago when I was in college and then just after I worked as a, as a photojournalist, like for newspapers. And it was funny because I was like a 20 year old guy kind of looking at the industry going, you know, where do I want to be in 20 years or <laughs> which would be like today. But uh, funny enough, I just sort of saw the writing on the wall there. Newspapers were in steep decline in terms of readership and the ability to add staff and stuff was just it was just plummeting at that moment. But I love the skills that I picked up in doing that kind of work. And it was right at the precipice of a change in wedding photography. If you remember wedding photography in like the 80s and the 90s is like, here's your 12 photos. You know, it's like we're going to take one of this and one of this and one of this because they're counting their frames with film. Right. And wedding photography back in the day that I, you look through, it just doesn't show a lot of moments. It doesn't take a lot of risks um, because of that. Well, right around the time that I was getting into it, 2001, 2002, um, it was really making a giant turn towards that documentary or photojournalistic style. And so it folded right into my skill set. So when I came to Dallas from, and believe it or not, I grew up in the West Coast. I went to Oregon State. I grew up in Salem, Oregon. Um, came to Dallas and uh, I started interning and looking for jobs in the photography industry. And then I uh, just started shooting some weddings for friends for the same reason you're talking about. It's like, yeah, they know that I'm a photographer and they need one. So they call you up and you're, you know, you're the uncle Bob at some point in your career. Right. So I shot a couple of weddings there and uh, people really responded to the work. And like the first year I just did it to make some money. I did about five weddings. The second year I did about 20 and then the every year after that for the last 18, I've done 40 plus. And that's kind of how we got into it. And it's just um, it's a really funny thing because I tell people that when you're a newspaper photographer, you're trying to take photographs that sort of inform and change the world. Right. You're looking for really impactful photos that uh, millions of people will see and it will make a difference in somebody's life and tell an amazing story. Wedding photography is really no different. It's just change an audience. You're still making really important photographs. You're still recording really important moments. You're just doing it for a smaller and smaller group of people. So uh, it really can bring the same skill sets um, that you have in that kind of work to to uh, to weddings. That's a that's a really cool um, approach and mindset uh, to that. Um, I don't see that, at least from my perspective, I don't see that too often. 
often it's like, you know, the wedding photographer is the hired help along with the DJ and the, the waiters and all that. And, <laughs> and then I see the photographers kind of like, ah, and then kind of, they, they play into that role. <laughs> so it's refreshing to see that you're, you're into it so much. When, when, when did that, that switch happen? Like, were you like super into weddings, like from the first one? Cause you kind of said, you know, Hey, I needed the dough and, or, or, or did it take like a few and you're like, Hey, I, I really, I really see the, I really like this and I want to do more. Um, you know, I think it happened pretty fast. Um, you know, I, I want to say it was in the first few, I think I was naive at the beginning as most new photographers are. And I did not know what all of the trappings and responsibilities of a wedding photographer really were. I was really just photographing things that I saw that were interesting because when you're a newspaper photographer, you're not really ever sent out with like, Oh, you must have this. You must have this. You must have this. You're like going out to find the story and find the interesting pictures. And I was doing the exact same thing at my weddings. And it wasn't until later on that I'm like, oh, you're supposed to get a picture of every bridesmaid going down the aisle, or you're supposed to do this, that, or the other. Those were things I kind of had to learn. Um, so in the process of like not really worrying about that, I was really concentrating on what I love. And so you know that's just become the hallmark of our style. So that that's kind of like your why then. It's like because you know you're focusing on 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 the love, which is cool. Um, what what is it that you're you're wanting your clients to kind of come away with, uh, when, when, so the shoot's over, they, you know, they've gone on their honeymoon, they've come back and you're ready to deliver whatever, you know, they deliver. Um, what, what are you, or what, are, what are, what are they leaving with as far as like, not just the product, but also the, the, uh, the memory, the experience. Yeah, I think the most powerful pictures of all time, at least in my opinion, are the ones that we tell stories about. Anytime you can pick up a picture and you can go, let me tell you about what was going on in this photograph, like, and it will transport you back to that moment. Those are the pictures that I really live for. I mean, I love pretty portraits as well, and we take a lot of time and care to do interesting and, and fun portraiture. But the ones that will really transcend time, the ones that, you know, you're thinking like, well, when he's a grandfather and he's telling these stories about what happened on his wedding day to his grandfather, grandkids. It's not going to be talking about portraits. He's going to be talking about what he's laughing about in that photo, who was standing next to him, what the moment was like. Those are the most powerful photos that we can we can give from a wedding. So that's really what I'm really hoping for is that they're sharing those pictures and they're telling stories. Um, that would be the ultimate. Um, now, in terms of deliverables, you know, I do tons of albums every year. Um, you know, that's why I always get tons of, of questions online about printing and resolution and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, just the mechanics of getting that done. But the bottom line is that um, about 90 percent of what I shoot winds up in print, which is an interesting place to be in a world where Instagram is everything and, and most photographs just wind up online. But about 90 percent of our clients wind up with a book, which means I'm going in, I'm, I'm designing and printing actual photographs on paper. What? What are those? They look, like yeah. a, the, they look kind of like square. And <laughs> right. You may have seen one before. <laughs> so uh, is your demographic typically older uh, couples getting married? Because I'm just kind of curious, like, is it, are the books still resonating with the, the younger crowd of millennials that are, you know, they're Instagram savvy and I mean, yeah, are, are they, they buying them? They really do. Um, and my, my clientele range is pretty far. I mean, I do... I would say the wedding, people getting married in general, at least in my market, are probably around 30 years old, but I do plenty that are up to 40 plus, depending on what's going on. And, um, you know, I think that that's, it's kind of like, you know, have you ever seen or noticed that there's like this resurgence of shooting film cameras out there? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of a millennial thing, too. You know, they're looking mm -hmm. for things that are tangible, and printed photographs are kind of the same thing. And so um, giving them something that they can't get themselves is always has value, right? And knowing how to design and print good photographs is something that's um, an art that not everybody has that in their skill set. Yeah, you know, that 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 actually, now that I think about it, you're, you're totally right. So in, in the world of photography, as you've experienced it, I'm sure going from a photojournalist in the wedding world is that, you know, there's this huge rush online and there's like a billions, literally billions of photographers on Instagram. It blows my mind to think about that. <laughs> and they're, the, a good amount of them are technically sound, at least for the small screen, and they'll talk about the tech. And then some of them will even talk a little bit about their knowledge of the technique, but it's so rare to see a photographer 
and regardless of where they are in their career, actually talk about the the making of the prints, the making of the books, why it's important. Um, and so I can totally see why for people for uh, a demographic that wants something tangible and um, in a way scarce, right? Uh, then that would be that would be valuable. So for the same, we'll just kind of put our our minds into like a 30 year old couple. They're getting their album, but they're going to want something online. So how, do, how does that work? You just, I know a lot of people kind oh. of doing DVDs or whatever, but how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, well, we don't do DVDs anymore because most of their laptops don't have DVD slots, right? right, so right. We're, we're kind of stuck there. I deliver a lot of videos on Vimeo and we do some hybrid products where we mix both, um, you know, uh, video and stills and uh, capturing audio at a wedding and put it all together for them. And, um, you know, all of that's delivered online. And of course they have private websites and slideshows and things like that. That's all done that way. And, you know, every wedding client gets a copy of their originals from us so they can download them and upload them to Instagram to their heart's content. But, you know, I mean, aren't you kind of worried for people who aren't super savvy about backing things up and having things last generations? Like one of the great things about a book or even a shoebox full of prints is that it's it's bound to make it through the decades. You know, it's, right. it's just more likely. Uh, I worry that when I deliver things only digitally to clients, they're going to get their USB drive and then that's going to get lost. And in point of fact, it's happened. I just replaced the DVD, I mean, a USB stick for a couple who lost it in the big floods in Houston a couple of years ago. Um, so there's, you know, but like, what's the thing you're running out of the house with when it's on fire? You know, it's like your wedding album and your photos. And, and if you take good care of it and that's not hard to do, it'll be there for generations. And uh, I just worry that people's hard drives and things like that are just like getting thrown out with the next generation and they go upgrade laptops and then they don't want to take the time to transfer over, you know, 50 gigs worth of photos or something. And then they're lost. So having printed materials has so many benefits in the long run. Yeah, that that's a really uh, good point. So I'm thinking of myself when I, I mean, I, I I grew up in film and I shot film in my in the beginnings of my uh, career, and uh, that's great. In fact, I have, <laughs> I got some from the lab right here. These are good. If I <laughs> yeah, see exactly. them and they're not cracked, and they're not creased, then they're good to go. It, but I can't look into my Drobo or my um, RAID array or my SSDs and see those files and know that they're there and know that they're safe. And case in point, and when I got into, I mean, I went all in on digital uh, for my business in 2005, 2006, and I was backing up everything on DVD, then I would have a hard drive, and then I would have an offsite drive, and I would circulate the, the two drives. But at some point, I forgot exactly what the, the the case was. Those both of those drives failed. I think they're the same brand, which is also a mistake. Uh, looking back, and I go to grab the DVDs, and because I was using one of the earlier DVD players, like I can't pull the data off these DVDs, and I don't know if it's because they were burned wrong. I, I just don't know. Like my technical interest in that stuff is very minimal with DVDs, and, and but. I'm like, cool, I have basically a year of photos that may or may not be on the DVDs and the drives had crashed. So that's like more or less most of 2006. So if I uh, was doing weddings as a business, I could potentially be in some trouble. But as you know, the photos that are most important are the ones that are the personal ones that I lost. Yeah, you know, and most good wedding photographers will have clauses in their contract that says they're not liable for the pictures for more than about a year. Right. So, you know, you know, that couple that came back to me, they didn't, um, you know, expect like a thousand percent that I was going to have them. They came back sort of going, oh, please tell me you still have them. And of course, I don't delete anything. I mean, I've got, uh, I don't know, I got about 130 um, two to four terabyte drives full of photos in my archive. Wow. Wow. Uh, Cause I just, I mean, it's just, it's better and easier for me just to archive the next set and bring the next set in and that kind of thing. And then of course you keep drives with your, you know, finished like files on, you know, JPEG format or whatnot, um, easily accessible, but all those raw files, I keep every single one of them. But, 
you know, it's like, I just don't expect clients to know these things, you know, like I send information home with them about how to do three, two, one and, and how to have all that stuff. And hopefully they've got cloud storage. But I mean, how many people do you know outside the photography industry that are really taking that super seriously? Not a lot, you know, that's why they automate backups on iPhones and things. And at least they have that, right? I mean, how many people in the photo industry are actually taking it seriously? You know, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Like I have some stuff in cloud. I use Backblaze. I got my drives and I'll have moments where I'm like, I just got to turn everything off and be like, all right, I got to spend a good amount of time uh, digging in, Yeah. you know, and then you need to transfer a computer. I mean, it's, t- it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough deal. I want to get back. I really want to dig into the tech, but I always have yeah. this saying, which I've totally ripped off from Pink Floyd is you, you can't have your pudding until you eat your meat. So let's <laughs> Well, let's get back to some uh, other stuff around wedding wedding photography in particular. Then I want to we'll have some fun with the tech. But, uh, you know, I had a friend of mine just get married and they were kind of lost for, you know, I guess I guess for a lot of people, though, they make the date and then it seems to come up real quick and then they're scrambling and they're like, oh, my God, how do I do this? And then it's like you could just see like. You're like watching the hairs turn gray and whatnot. Or if you have children, I, I have a child and <laughs> this used to be all black like a year ago, right. my beard. Um, but anyways, um, so th- I was looking online, like what people are, you know, could use some help. And I see that there's, uh, you know, people need tips for bride, for like brides and grooms. So how do I want to talk to you about that? Like how would uh, a bride approach the groom with some tips, maybe doing some things that they may feel that their soon to be spouse may not want to do, you know, like, you know, guys, guys get, you know, we get kind of, we're kind of macho. We may want to, may not want to do things with flowers or (laughs) certain songs. I don't know. It's different for everybody. So what, how do you, cause I know part of what you do as a, as a professional wedding photographer is you help the, the, the wedding party be relaxed and you guide them into what's going to help them so that it makes your job easier. So can you give us some tips for like the bride and groom? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the first thing that I do with my brides and grooms is we always do, or I try to always do engagement portraits, which is a session before the wedding day where I take them out in their regular you know, plain clothes kind of thing and take pictures of them. And that always winds up being a training ground for them and for me, because every couple is different. Every couple responds differently in front of the camera. And I really need to know what makes them feel awkward, what makes them feel good, what makes them laugh. And then they learn how to take direction from me. Um, and that makes the wedding day that much smoother. Um, But, you know, by and large, I really don't have a lot of people ever giving me trouble, like buying into the process of taking pictures. I think that, you know, by the time they get to me, they've already invested a, a, you know, a good amount of money in their wedding and in their wedding photography. And so they really have invested in the idea of getting great photographs. So I don't really have anybody who's like not into it, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, my my advice for brides and grooms on the wedding day um, usually revolves around just making sure that they look good and that they're relaxed. Um, on the wedding day, like I think stresses are probably the hardest thing that come across. Um, so my two tips for a bride is if you um, it can all handle it, I really highly recommend professional hair and makeup artists. And then I also recommend a wedding planner. If they have both of those things and they have me on board, they've got a great team of people that are making sure that their stress level is low and that they look great. And then uh, as far as, you know, working with brides and grooms, you know, it's really about creating a sense of there being some moment in the photograph. I always tell couples that if you feel stiff in a picture, it will look stiff no matter how perfectly placed your hands are or whatnot. So I always try and keep things moving and keep things light and fun. And I tell people, if we come away from the photo session where I'm directing you and you had a good time, that's the best case scenario, because that means that I've gotten everything that I need and you guys didn't have to stand there and feel like this was a beating. I think every bride and groom come into the process thinking, oh, my gosh, I really just don't want to stand there on the altar for an hour after my ceremony and uh, be gritting my teeth by the end. And that's never the case with, um, you know, with wedding photography these days. We have that stuff in and out in 20 minutes and we're on the run. Um, But, you know, that's not to say that we don't pay attention to details, too. And I think that that's where, you know, hiring the right photographer is important in that um, making sure the dress does look good, making sure the hands are in the right place. There's ways to do that through direction without it being stiff, if that makes sense. Um, So. 
The other thing about uh, wedding photography, if they want to get great photographs, is that uh, they, if they can give us, you know, interesting locations and give us interesting light, that will help a ton. So we always have a hand in the process of helping design the wedding day so that we're getting our best foot forward in terms of being able to give them great stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you know, and come to think of it, wedding photography is one of those areas of photography where it's like, it, it, maybe I'm totally off base, but it seems like people are going to Costco on a Friday and they're picking up their DSLR off the off the pallet, you know, when you first walk in. And then on Saturday morning, as they're getting their batteries put into the camera and understanding how to turn it on, they're shooting their first wedding. You know, there's a ton, there seems to be like so many people getting into wedding photography, I think more than, I would say maybe more than anything, because we all know somebody that's going to get married and, um, so I, I could I could just imagine from the perspective of a bride and groom, they're trying to find a wedding photographer, what what and, and find one that's going to suit their style, their budget, whatever. How, how does what are some tips for brides and grooms that are looking for wedding photography? I mean, what should they look for and what should they be on alert for? Sure. I, I kind of have two big pieces of advice when people are looking for wedding photographers. The first one is that make sure the portfolio of the wedding photographer shows a wedding day that's similar to the one that you're going to have. I think one of the things that people, a trap people can fall into is if like they look at tons of pictures of wedding photographers working out in, in ranches and in fields or in Italy or <laughs> wherever it might be. And there's all this great natural light work and it looks amazing, but they're getting married in a church in downtown Dallas and having their reception in a ballroom. If that's the case, you need to make sure that your photographer has the chops to be able to creatively control lighting and things like that so that you get beautiful photographs even in those dark spaces. Um, so make sure that the portfolio of your wedding is matched to your photographer. That'd be my first tip. The second tip I give people is that hiring a wedding photographer, hiring a good wedding photographer is not about days that are going perfectly. You hire a great wedding photographer to be able to handle anything that gets thrown their way. Uh, I don't know a single wedding photographer who's been doing this more than five minutes who doesn't realize that weddings are moving events, that there's weather problems, there's delays, there's uh, timing changes, there's just all kinds of things that can happen. And a great wedding photographer will be able to make beautiful work even in those constraints, even with that stress. Um, if, if everything runs perfectly, then that's great. You're going to get awesome photographs. But what I'm hoping that my clients know is that even if things don't go exactly according to plan, even if we have to make changes on the fly, I'm still there. I'm still working creatively with them and I can solve any problem. Uh, you know, a lot of wedding photographers get into this and they think they know their settings on their camera. They're like, oh, I can go and take a photo, but they're not prepared for just about everything that can get thrown at you. And I got to tell you, weddings are a wonderful proving ground for that because everything will get thrown at you at some point or another. <laughs> right. I have photographed weddings in the snow, in the rain, uh, you know, in complete darkness under just candlelight and in beautiful, you know, sunny Colorado meadows at sunset. Like there's just everything under the sun. Um, and, you know, being prepared for all of those things in terms of not only what you bring, like in terms of gear to the wedding, but just like knowing how to uh, pose people and, and use the natural light to your advantage is something that you pick up um, over time. So that's the reason why you hire wedding photographers that maybe are more expensive or more experienced is not for the the perfect day. It's for anything that could happen. Man, I, I, I get that a hundred percent. Man, I, I, that really resonates with me and I hope it resonates with people listening to this because it's true. Like this, like the smoothest weddings, there's always something that happens because there's so many moving parts. And then you think about photography, just the act of actually using your camera today, there's a lot of moving parts with different things. But then on top of that, you have the, the, the human element, whereas you as a professional need to understand uh, that people may be feeling a certain type of emotion to kind of operate with empathy and to have direct and clear communication that allows people to feel empowered, uh, managing you know, some rando family member that'll show up in the middle of the thing, maybe intoxicated or something, you know, it's like all these things happen. And then of course you got somebody else that, right. You're getting ready to take a photo and I'm going to ask you about this now. And then you see this right in front of your lens and you're like, Oh my God, get that phone out away. How do I, um, you know, how, how do you, how are you dealing with that actually? So we're seeing everyone's got a phone, everyone takes pictures. They don't really do anything with them, but they're just, 
snapping for the sake of snapping, it seems like surely you you are running into the the, the case where phones are kind of darting out in front of you at some point, right? Um, well, the only time of day when that really becomes a problem is in the aisle in a church, you know, like in a, you know, in terms of people like leaning their phone out and mm-hmm. trying to get a, to get a thing. And there's really nothing that can be done in that scenario other than to anticipate it and put yourself in a position where it's not going to be a problem. Um, you know, and I've worked around a lot of those things and 99.99% of the time I'm, I'm aware of a person who is going to be a problem and I'll position myself to avoid that. Um, but you know, in terms of stopping people from taking pictures of weddings, I never do because those are all friends and family and I don't have any right to stop them from making photographs. A lot of the things that I do in terms of lighting, for example, especially in churches with strobes and things like that, it's going to eliminate their ability to get you know, a good photo. You know, I was just working on a, on a YouTube video talking about why you would upgrade from a cell phone to an actual camera. And I think weddings are just about the most awful scenario for a cell phone picture that you could possibly imagine. I mean, I see week after week people try and take pictures on dance floors at wedding receptions, and the phone just doesn't have a snowball's chance of getting anything that would be any good. They all turn out blurry. They all don't have enough light on them. And so uh, I don't worry about it too much to be totally honest with you that's cool um and that that's that you know i don't know what answer i was looking for but i'm like that sounds like a totally <laughs> that's the answer from somebody who's got years of experience so you, you could totally hear it versus the person that's going to put an article online trashing the uh the people holding up the phone because you i see that frequently um are is there so are you when you're doing your like initial consultations are there certain things you're kind of like Hey, uh, bride and groom, the bee. Just so you guys know, um, these things could be challenging, and one of them would be people shooting phones out. Or, I mean, do you kind of like prepare them just to say these are some things that could help the wedding day be smoother. Um, or is it, you know, what I mean. You know, I just don't feel like brides and grooms are terribly in control of those things. Every once in a while, I'll have a bride and groom who will have an unplugged wedding where they'll put signage up to ask people not to take photographs. There's still always a couple of those people who are still taking video or or taking stills in those scenarios. It's, It's just not something that's terribly controllable by anyone. Um, So by and large, we don't really worry about it. Um, If, um, you know, if their wedding planner wants to put up an unplugged sign, sometimes that works great. But um, to be honest with you, I just don't try and stress them out with that kind of thing. Um, I don't want them, you know, worrying that my photographs or whatever are not going to turn out because we we can work around it. That's great. That, that That's that's super cool. Um, yeah, because there's so many moving parts with any kind of shoot, and it's always something coming up. Um, it made me think of uh, the singer uh, Nina Simone. She, uh, in her middle of her shows, if somebody was not paying attention, she would stop. The entire show. She'd be like, hey, you. Hey, you. Where are you going? Come <laughs> sit, sit back down. And she would just wait until he sat back down or she'd leave the stage. Um, you know, this is like, you know, in the in the 80s and even earlier. And today, if she were alive with smartphones, I don't think that would even – that would be quite a quite a scene. And I know a lot of big bands are doing that um, too on, on the phones. So, you know, we're – there's nothing we could do to stop all these new photographers coming in. And it's kind of cool to see all these new photographers coming in as well. It's kind of inspiring in many ways. So how, if someone were coming to you and they're like, Hey, I, I'm going to go buy my, my camera tomorrow and start shooting weddings. Um, yeah. Any tips? Like how, what, what should I, what should I try to do well? And what should I avoid as a new photographer shooting weddings? Um, well, there's, I mean, Ideally, you would have. It depends how much experience you have with the so camera. So, saying, saying they have no experience, they go oh, they, they go to they go to Costco, get their their palette yeah. camera, and they're ready. Um, they're ready to start a business. I think one of the great proving grounds for if you're getting into professional photography is to look at doing portraiture first because there's chances for redos and you can slow down and spend some time really working with people and whatnot in those cases. Um, But the thing you need to do if you want to get into weddings is probably to shadow some people and like do sort of some internship uh, assisting kind of work would be the number one way to get a feel for what it's like. Um, the other, you know, big inclination people have these days is to do free or unpaid or reduced price work. And I'm not actually against that in the short term. If you are new to it and you have a cousin or a friend getting married and you want to go do some wedding photography for them, as long as they know what they're getting into and everybody's being transparent about what's 
what's going to happen. I think that's fine. I just um, the the only pitfall I would have or that I would say you can roll into is that I see some photographers who come out and they uh, actually are fairly good photographers and they start putting out these lower prices. And then all of a sudden they've got 18 months of work booked at a really low price and they're really working for free or they're at a deficit in that scenario. Um, you know, and it's important to understand your pricing and, and understand what it takes to make a profit. And don't get into weddings without a business license, without insurance, and, and those kinds of things. Those are That's like a minimum. You must have a contract with your clients. And pieces, places like PPA, for example, can do a great job of helping you get up to speed on those kinds of things. Um, but don't go into this blind. You know, this is a business, and, and take that part seriously. And especially considering it's a wedding. It's not like, you know, if you missed the, the first kiss or whatever because you were messing around with your camera, you can't be like, hey – Everybody, can you stop and DJ, please, <laughs> can you guys go back in that door and come out? I, I, my camera's ready now. I don't think that would go over too well at some point. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, and maybe it happens too. Who knows? Um, so you're, you shoot weddings and then you shoot portraits. Are, are, they, are these portraits, these are portraits for like individuals and families or are these like corporate um, I do quite a bit of other types of stuff. Um, you know, we do family portraits, we do headshots, we do some corporate work. Um, you know, I think that as a pro, it's really important to try and have as many baskets as possible in front of you, uh, just because you never know which one of those might, you know, start taking a nosedive in terms of popularity and what another one might just become really popular. And so it's just good to even out your, um, your streams of income. Um, but primarily speaking, I mean, we're a wedding and portrait, you know, studio. So um, we probably do 50 or so family sessions a year. And I do, I don't know, maybe 100 headshots, you know, something like that. And then there are 40 weddings. And then I have, let's see, maybe a half a dozen corporate clients that I do various kinds of work for. Okay. So there are some commercial photography uh, aspects in there. Is that all marketed under the same brand or is there a separate brand? No, yeah, I have separate brands for each. Oh, okay, cool. So I know you got the, you know, you got a family uh, blog, website blog, and, and then you get the wedding. But I didn't realize you had a, a corporate one too. That's that's great. Um, is there? Do you ever get asked to do any kind of photography that you're like, ah, I, I don't really shoot that, and you know? How... Um, do I ever get asked to do? Anything yeah. Like so that? like, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you say no? to the work oh. coming in if it's something you don't shoot. So if someone comes to you and are like, hey, can you shoot the interior of this hotel? And, you know, like, you know, I could probably do that, but I don't know if that's something that I should put my time and effort into. Yeah, usually what I'll just do is say, that's not a, something I specialize in, but I'd love to refer you to somebody that I know that does that work. And so I usually pass it on to a colleague of mine if I really feel like I'm not a good fit for it. Um, I would say, you know, 99% of the time, I'm not getting those calls. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but um, but yeah, when I when I have run across an odd thing or here or there, um, you know, like um, boudoir photography, for example, um, as a guy, I just don't. It's just not in my wheelhouse in terms of uh, something that I really want to get into. So I refer that to um, some of my colleagues. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm the same way. There are certain types of photography that I tried early on in my career, and I'm I'm like. I like the way that looks, but now that I photographed it, I don't have that that connection that I think we we you know we all need to have there. So what are the what are the, like the crossovers in your in your business from going from like the 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 portrait work to the uh, the, the wedding work? Because the wedding is is the the core of your of your business, right? Right. So then is it is it the wedding or is the 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 portrait work often from the families of the the people that you photograph their weddings or how to, what, what is there a cross? I'm just curious as to yeah. where the crossover is. Yeah, actually everything is connected to it. Um, my corporate work is actually primarily from either grooms or parents of uh, brides and grooms that own businesses um, where they, I worked for their family and then they hired me to do corporate work after that. All of the families are either former clients and from weddings or they're connected to former clients from weddings. Um, very few you know, come out of the blue. Of course they do, but uh, I usually find out that they knew somebody who knew somebody and that's the reason why they're coming to us. Um, and then the headshots again, like, I mean, this is how a great business works, you know, is this word of mouth and this referral has always been my number one way of like, 
uh, getting the word out. And so if I do a groom's wedding and he's a dentist and then he needs headshots for his office, he'll come back to me um, and I can handle it for him. Cool. And then if you give him a good deal, he'll be extra gentle when you go in and get your teeth worked on. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and if you're really high priced, he's like, oh, he ran out of Novocaine. You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, you're working basically, it sounds like, in within generations of, of families, right? So if people get married, then they have children. Are you photographing like their newborns as well? Or are you, is that something you, you pass off to somebody else? No, yeah, we do newborns and, and Christmas card portraits and all that kind of stuff for all of our. I really hope that, you know, as many of the families as I work for as possible can be lifelong clients. I can't see a great reason why anybody wouldn't want that. Um, you know, everything that is everything that's involved in family portraiture is in, also involved in a wedding in one way or another. So uh, the skill sets transfer really, really easily. Um, there are some things that you have to learn about newborns in particular that are um, different than weddings, I suppose. But once they get to, you know, being kids and, and being a family, it's it's really it's an easy, you know, shift over to that type of work. Got it. Got it. Okay. I, I, I get that somewhat because I have a three-year-old, but like I had uh, Tracy McGlosky on uh, a few weeks ago and she shoots these babies. I'm like, I'm like, how do you get them in these outfits? And how? I'm like, I'm just like clueless. Cause you know, when my son was first born, I was just like, how do I get an extra 10 minutes of sleep? I was totally not thinking. And now that I'm like, he's older, I'm like, man, I had, I, maybe I could have experimented with them if I had, if I had the energy, but so, you know, there, I find that these, this type you know, different types of uh, photography, especially with children, to be to be fascinating. Um, are you not doing anything with family pets, or is it just kind of like if they no, bring them? No, yeah, I mean, I get a lot of dogs in my family portraits, but not pet photography, in spe you know, specifically like photos of pets. And I would say, um, just on the note about what Tracy does, like uh, there's different types of, of newborn photographers, just like there's different types of wedding photographers or anything else, right? And when I approach wedding uh, newborn photography, I do it from more of a documentary lifestyle sort of standpoint rather than more of a fine art kind of look. Um, and, you know, like babies in baskets and things like that, you're not going to find that kind of stuff um, in my portfolio. Video. Oh, so, tell me, tell me more because I'm sorry. I'm, in my mind, every time I think of newborn photography, I always think of like that Ann Getty's kind of yeah. thing. So tell me, tell me about your approach. Cause I'm sorry. I didn't see the photos on your site, uh, but I, I love the, I'm, I'm fascinated now with the, how do you, how do you, how do you do photo documentary of a person that doesn't move and sleeps most of the day? Right. So, well, the first thing is I don't focus on props as a way to deal with baby photography. The only props I have are mom and dad and maybe what's ever in their home or what's ever in my studio, but it's it's just blankets and things like that. I really try and concentrate on the connection between the people. So, you know, for a lot of the session, mom and dad might be holding the baby and, and working with the baby that way. And then um, when I'm in a home, I try to do what I would call lifestyle kind of things. I put them in scenarios where they might actually find themselves later that afternoon, for example. Um, because like, when I remember when I was first a dad, I had a, you know, a, a one-year-old and then I had my, my son who was a newborn. And uh, one of my favorite pictures was my wife took was me sleeping with one of them in either arm on the couch. You know what I mean? So trying to kind of recreate a little bit of that in terms of what we're doing in a photo session just allows them to kind of put themselves in scenarios where they have a memory of what it was like to be a parent of a newborn. And that's where I really like to go with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not to say that we don't do pictures of the baby by themselves and things like that, but I try and keep that very clean and minimalistic and, and just focusing on the child itself rather than, you know, the blankets and the poses and the head dresses and the baskets. Um, and it's not that I don't appreciate that work. I think that work is amazing. And I like that fantasy is very popular for some people. Um, but I think it's important that the market has lots of different types of work out there too. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, it reminds me of how I photograph my own family. And unfortunately I'm never really in it unless, I mean, I am because I'm holding a camera, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not actually in, yeah. <laughs> in front of the lens. Um, but yeah, that's cool. Cause I was always like, man, wouldn't it be cool to get some photos of us just kind of doing what we do? Cause I have my, my whole house is lit with different color temperature lights and I can, you know, photographer, you know, that's how, but yeah, um, yeah. so, you know, whenever I shoot, I'm like, Oh, this is great. So you're, you go to home and then you're like, all right, what do you, are you asking them, you know, tell me about your normal day or what is it that you guys do that's special that throughout the week where you have time together? Is that kind of what you're doing? And then you're kind of putting them, re recreating that moment in a way? 
Yeah, a little bit of that exactly. And then if it's a newborn, they usually need more direction than that because they haven't had the baby long enough to <laughs> even have a routine. Right. Um, but they're going to have a chair in the nursery that they spend time with the baby in. They're going to have their living room is going to be set up in a way where you know they can hang out with him or her. Right. And they're going to, um, you know, dad, just getting a photo of a dad just holding the baby on the couch, just, you know, looking at the baby and <laughs> thinking about the baby. The, the looks that come across their faces in those scenarios are just so 100 percent authentic, if you know what I mean. Oh, like, yeah. And I think that their tiredness at that moment in their life actually leads to like their defenses just go straight through the floor. Right. I mean, like they're, they're, they're just as raw as you could possibly get them in that moment. But um, but yeah, like uh, I'm just going to pick some things like just, you know, feeding the baby and, and changing the baby and hanging out with them. And, you know, if it's just being there on the couch or whatever, like those are all things that are going to they're going to spend a lot of time doing over the first six months. And so that's kind of how I approach that. When if it's um, an older family, then yeah, I'm always asking you know families, what do you guys do together? Where do you guys like to hang out together? What are some activities that you guys like, so that we can uh, maybe put them in some scenarios that have some meaning, like have some context to them, um, and that's where that's how I kind of approach that. And in point of fact, one of my favorite things to teach, you know. Um, is parents. I love teaching parents how to be better photographers, to be totally honest with you, because there's nothing more authentic than a dad taking pictures of their own kids or a mom taking pictures of their own kids. And I think that, um, you know, the iPhone generations, you know, that have come along, like they, they need the most help in my opinion, um, just in their ability to, uh, to deal with that. You know, my kids now are eight and 11. And I always tell people that, you know, cell phones aren't half bad at taking a picture of something that's like three feet in front of you, or even, a mountainscape that you know it's okay but if you want to take a picture of your kid playing soccer or you want to take a picture of your kid during a recital or you need to you know handle a lot of these other assignments that you have as a parent photographer you are woefully undereducated and 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 whatnot and being able to get a great photograph and i know this because i am constantly taking pictures of my friends and their kids for them so that they have some record of these big moments in their lives Got it. That so you're you're doing these different things with them, and then are they getting books too? They kind of say, hey, this is your uh, basically a generic day in your life of a parent. You know what I mean? Yeah, it either comes the end result of that is usually one or two things. It's either a group of pictures hung on a wall together, you know, um, where you design, you know, like different canvas sizes and put them together in space, you know, on the wall, or it's a book. Yeah, it's one of the two. That's cool. That's really cool. So basically, when the kid's older, it can be like, you know, look at all the work mom and dad put in to take care of you. And now you're a teenager and you're busting our chops. Get out of here. Well, you <laughs> that, know, it all just that'll yeah, be I'll just it all just boils back to give me a picture you can tell a story about. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's interesting, like in this time that we're in, it's an age of screens and and you can have all the the, the technology and everything from a phone to a camera is just phenomenal. What we're still thirsty for is that is that experience, because that's something that can't be. I mean, I guess in a way you can say you can be manufactured through like a Disneyland, but that's not the same as the experience of being uh, having a moment with your new uh, baby and your wife or husband or the wedding or anything, those experiences cannot be manufactured. You know? Yeah. So and you can't go, you can't go to the Apple store on launch day and buy that experience. You have to, you know, live it and then hire somebody to, to show that, Hey, it's proof that you actually were, you actually were there. So, um, cool. I, I want to talk about gear. I want to geek out a little bit about gear because that's kind of where I, uh, I came to, to find you. So you, are shooting your work, is it just some of it with Micro Four Thirds or is it all of it in particular with Olympus Micro Four Thirds? Yeah, we're 100% Olympus right now. EM1Xs and EM1 Mark IIs and I have a Pen F and an EM10 Mark III. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. And you're doing, so you're doing your video work with it and your stills? Oh man, since they did the firmware upgrade to the EM1 Mark II, the video on that thing went through the roof. Um, just because, uh, you know, previous to that firmware upgrade, it it just really couldn't be a good run and gun camera in the sense that you had to manually focus it every time. But now with the image stabilizer and the great video autofocus in that thing and the 4K, I mean, it's like it's almost getting to be ridiculously good. So, yeah, I use it both in my personal life and for my wedding clients. 
Got it. I know because I'm I got one myself to play with. There you so go. It's it's amazing um, what I'm getting out of this. I'm like oh, um, but I'll I'm gonna have a whole nother series of videos about the Olympus and I'm playing with the Lumix and stuff. So you're doing all this stuff with small cameras and what did what did you have before like a, like a DSLR? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's see. So I started my career with Nikon's back when I was like 13, 14. Same, right? <laughs> And then, um, let's see. Yeah, I went to you know. Remember the D1, the Nikon D1. Yeah, oh yeah. That those were the first the first the digital cameras that were assigned to the newspapers I work for. So we used those. And man, like that was back in the early days, right? Yeah. Um, and then you know, I kind of stuck with them for a little while. I eventually changed over to Canon because Canon had the first full frame cameras, first 35 millimeter size sensors, and. At that time, there, there was a pretty huge jump in image quality. It, it wasn't really the size of the sensor, but the image quality itself made a huge jump. Mm -hmm. And so I stuck with those for a while. And then um, I actually uh, spent some time with the original four-thirds format for um, a bit. And I really wanted to jump into that system full time, but there was still a, a pretty big gap without a lot of the benefits that we enjoy from micro four thirds these days. Um, it was kind of like, well, it's a four thirds camera, but it really behaves, looks and sounds just like a Canon camera. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, so I eventually stuck it out with them until I hit micro four thirds. And I really waited on micro four thirds uh, for my professional work until we had dual card slots. Uh, that was when the M1 Mark II hit the streets. I'm like, oh, that camera can handle this work now because I've got everything that I need in that body. Okay, good. So that so it was the dual card slots that kind of that was a missing ingredient for you. Yeah. Um, what is it about the dual card slots that that is is of interest to you? You know, it's not really mechanical or electronic error that I find is the biggest problem. It's a human error. <laughs> Um, if you lose your cards or you get in a car accident on the way home or someone steals your stuff, that has been uh, over the 18 years that I've been doing this. That's Those are the scenarios where we've lost cards before. Um, so what we do at a wedding is we shoot dual cards and then we separate them and we drive separate cars to the wedding. And then there's two sets of the cars going home in different locations. And that goes triple for when you're shooting destinations weddings, destination weddings, which we do quite a bit too. We really want to have multiple copies in multiple places. Um, so, you know, it's just good insurance. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think I've had knock on wood, um, a car just go completely corrupt on me that I wasn't recoverable. Um, but I know it does happen. So I have that insurance too. And when you're shooting once in a lifetime events and you don't have duplicates of things, it's just a little bit more risky than risk that I want to take on. Yeah. And a little more stress that that's in the back of your head, um, subconsciously or consciously. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, like you were talking about the human element that makes making errors, which I never thought about cause I don't make errors, <laughs> but I, I never, I never thought about that actually. Um, because for me, like, you know, when I would do editorial work, it'd just be me and my camera, but you know, the idea of like how, you know, then I would put it on two separate drives and the drives would be uh, separated, but the idea of the cards being separated, and I, I honestly, I never thought about that, but that is, that is an awesome reason why you would have dual card slots up until this point. I'm kind of like, eh, dual card slots. What's the big deal? But no, that, that's, that's phenomenal. And so you basically, at that point, you were like, DSLRs are out. You went and sold them all and you went all in. Yeah, that was it. I mean, the, Olympus Micro Four Thirds gear, it just, I always tell people this, it like, it opened up a different avenue of creativity that you didn't have with DSLRs at the time. And when the E1 Mark II was announced, it even had more advantages um, versus other cameras than they do today because the other camera brands have caught up in various ways and things over time. But it was just the abilities that it had in terms of unlocking things that weren't like the typical, like I need the bigger, faster, lower light thing. Like there's other things in photography that you can explore than just worrying about those two parameters, if that makes sense. So what was it when you started playing with Micro Four Thirds? You're like, as soon as I got dual car slots, I'm all in because it's doing these things that's helping me expand my creativity. What what was it that was helping you expand your, your creativity? Well, you know, I think um, 
you know, the, the, the basic ones that I, they aren't so sexy in terms of being like technologies or whatnot, but the very angle screen and the autofocus system of that camera um, and the speed of that camera, the silent shutter of that camera, these very basic things we almost take for granted today make a huge difference in terms of images that you're able to capture. Being able to go overhead or underfoot um, at a moment's notice, uh, being able to see exposures and see compositions when the camera's over your head is a big deal. Uh, being able to turn on the silent shutter when you want to walk into a room and you don't want to be the center of attention, those are huge, huge advantages to mirrorless that weren't available to us in DSLRs, if that makes sense. Um, and since that time, then we've expanded into things like, you know, um, live composite and, you know, playing with um, uh, handheld high res and the built in ND and, um, and just, you know, a myriad of technologies that help us solve certain problems. But at a really basic level, being able to see your exposure in live preview, being able to have a very angle screen, having autofocus that was dead accurate all the time, um, having lenses that Olympus makes that are in sharp corner to corner. These were all just magnificent um, advantages that they didn't have in DSLR land. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, when you're seeing these things, it brings me back to like when I first started talking about uh, mirrorless, I would tell people, look, you could see your black and white photo in the viewfinder, and it really didn't click with people until they put it up to their eye. Then it was just like, oh, damn. Like, it just kind of had, like, their mind was, like, expanded, <laughs> you know? And uh, for me, I was like, no, 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 it really, I mean, until people experience it, um, it's hard to, it's hard to, I think, to explain it in some ways. Uh, for me, the one, well, not the one, it's hard to put on one feature, but I, I always use a highlight shadow warnings, clipping warnings, and I got it set to high shoot, so I don't really have to use a histogram anymore. And that helped me just, even when I was shooting professionally with the EM5 Mark I, be able to shoot magazine covers and whatnot, and like in and out fast, because I never, ever had to worry about, as the lighting would change in South Florida at the time, you know, am I getting the right exposure? I'm like, I could see it. Uh, what What is, give me a, a few examples of things that, really, really kind of push it over the edge for you where you're like, this camera is giving me, I mean, I know you just mentioned some, but this camera is really giving me something that I can't, I can't get. It doesn't have to be technical, but I'm just, just curious. Like what's that one thing you're like, oh yeah, I'm so glad to use this. Okay. So I'm going to go a different direction than, than just going pure specs, but totally. let, let me say this. When you carry around heavy 35 millimeter DSLR gear, day after day and you're working 12 hours at a time like it starts to weigh on your creativity because you just honestly like look at that going do i want to pull out a 300 2a for this picture or can i just get something i'm okay with with my 70 200 for example when you move to micro four thirds you know even if you discount you know like uh, system weight or whatever. Like, okay, let's say we just had even system weight or whatever. Um, the lenses that you have at your disposal on your shoulders all day, uh, working with the gear, it just, it's like you get more for less. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. and like just having like, for example, just being able to go, you know what? I really think this photo would look amazing if it was shot from floor level. When you're shooting with a DSLR, you're like you're on your belly trying to compose that picture, getting yourself all kinds of messed up. Yeah, your head's <laughs> and, all tweaked to look through the viewfinder and stuff. And it's the funniest thing when people first move to mirrorless because I'll see them. I'll be like, dude, why are you doing that? Like just <laughs> uh, because you get out of the break, dirt. Old, break old habits, right? Right. Um, but for me, like, for example, the 40 to 150 that Olympus makes is like the best ceremony lens in the history of ceremony lenses. I used to carry a 7200 and a 300 28 because there are certain churches in Dallas, Texas that are half a mile long and you just want to be able to get nice close photos. Well, now I've got a 40 to 150 that can handle all that in a nice compact little package. And, you know, keep that up with the, like, add that to the fact that it's not only tiny, that it's not only silent, that the autofocus is not only amazing. And you've just got, like, in my mind, an almost unbeatable package, you know. Um, so for me, like, the portability and, and the um, and the extra creativity I get from the um, flexibility that I have with having smaller lenses with me um, has made a huge difference in just my my energy level in terms of wanting to make images throughout a long wedding day. I, I, and I and I get that too because when I sold all my DSLRs, 
um, it's because I wasn't using them too much anymore. And then I had a, um, a pen mini and I was, you know, I, I wouldn't shoot with the DSLRs cause it was so heavy. And that's the thing. So you were rocking out a 300 to eight in your bag, plus your 70 to 200 and your 28 to 70 or whatever it was full frame lenses all day. Yeah. All day. Yeah. That's insane. Did, we had did, a, did your back, was your, did you end up getting some like back strain and stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I carry, people always laugh, you know, because I carry the bulk of my camera gear in a rolling think tank bag, uh, just because I don't want it on my back, um, you know, even with micro four thirds. But um, but the point is that I can have that 300 or 28 on me because I've got my 40 to 150 uh, on me all the time that, you know, that's an easy thing for me to carry. So, um, but yeah, you know, like, and let's double that up with the fact that we travel a lot now and trying to get stuff through airports. Like I'm taking off for Carmel, California for a wedding tomorrow. And, you know, what if we want to shoot video and stills at a wedding? Like if I was doing that with, um, with older, heavier, bigger gear, like that means that we would have more and more and more bags. And now I can pack things down to much smaller cases and, and still get all of that amazing technology where I need it to be. Right. And then the end result is that you're getting the photos that you want and then maybe even more so. And then, you know, what are, what are the, the clients saying? Are they, are they like, Hey Joseph, that, that low light shot doesn't really work too well. And uh, can you add more bokeh? I gotta tell you out of like 700 weddings that I've shot and thousands of portrait sessions, I have never had anybody comment on that ever. They were like, they were like, Joseph can, uh, we have to have a talk. The bokeh is not, um, uh, I saw on the YouTube, it's, it's not Bocalicious <laughs> to the level of Bocalicious. They never, they never bring that up. Customers never bring that up. Not one single time. And no. I always, I always tell people like one of my favorite quotes Ansel Adams ever gave was, "There's nothing worse than a uh, sharp photo of a fuzzy idea." And what that really translates to me is that Instagram. if they're, if they're worried about your grain or your, you know, whatever it is, technically in a photo, they're not looking at the photo. Like you've lost them to begin with. So, um, yeah, but people who have photos in their homes, they just, it, it doesn't even register with them. They don't care what kind of camera you're shooting with. They don't care what kind of lens you have on. They don't even care how out of focus the background is. Um, in point of fact, you know, I think that a lot of people actually appreciate sometimes being able to see more of it. I think that there's this um, move in photography. And I think it really has to do with the journey that a lot of YouTubers and people who are getting into photography at the beginning kind of get into. And it's really, really easy to go, you know what, how I'm going to. Uh-oh. 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 I think we lost you. There we go. We're back. What happened? We're back. Oh, <laughs> you're back. So you're saying was, it's, it, you're talking about the journey of um, the uh, YouTubers. Sure. So there's tons and tons of new photographers every year. Right. And I sort of think that what happens to them is like, like, have you ever purchased a fisheye lens before? Oh, yeah. OK, so the first time you buy a fisheye lens, you start finding all kinds of use for your fisheye lens. You're like. Holy smokes, I can use it here, and I can use it here, and I can use it there. And then all of a sudden you look back at your work and go, there's way too many fisheye pictures in here. Right. So the same thing happens with young photographers. It's like they learn a skill, which is to turn their lens to 1.4 or 1.2 or whatever it is. And they go, well, then how can I make it more shallow? And how can I make it more shallow? And the thing of it is that it's, it's, it's actually a really pretty look. There's nothing wrong with shallow depth of field, but it's like one brush in your palette. You know, it's one look. And it's often one, often not the one that makes the most meaningful photographs. Um, when we, you know, uh, create those kinds of images, it just takes it, everything completely out of context. You don't know where you are anymore because you've thrown it so completely out of focus. And so if you're really into that, I always tell people, you know, whatever floats your boat, <laughs> whatever blows your hair back, that's fine. But to me, if you look at my heroes in photography, which are guys like uh, National Geographic photographers like David Allen Harvey or Bill Allard or, you know, uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, you know, things like that. What they're really doing is recording slices of life that show context. And one of the hallmarks of great photographers, in my opinion, is somebody who is paying attention to the corners of their frame, that is paying attention to the background of their frame. And they are intentionally leaving things in certain areas because it adds to context to their picture. And I think that that is oftentimes lost on a lot of YouTubers who review lenses. And, 
you know, principally speaking, some of those guys are photographers, but there's also a bunch of them that are more like camera nerds. And I don't have anything against camera nerds. You know, I think that people can be really into cameras. That can be a hobby. Um, but those of us who are really into photography, that's a separate thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was like, I felt like I was listening to myself, um, but someone who was saying it in a much nicer way than I would, I would put it. But, but yeah, it, you know, I, I noticed that as well as like, you know, when people do get into photography, they do, or they're like, Oh, what can I do with this camera that I spent all this money on that my smartphone can't. And one of them is making it larger or the back, the background more blurry. The other thing is going into people say low light, but they actually mean poor light. Cause it, you know, they don't know how to shoot yet. So it's like the lighting is awful. And they're like, um, but what's interesting too, is on the flip side is you're seeing these same, often these same photographers that have zero skills and, and, the craft of photography blowing up their online business and, and Instagram, which I know is a different show, but it's just interesting to see that. Um, but like, you know, when I, when I talk to people that have been around for a while and they're shooting professionally or they're just, you know, they're a hobbyist and they're just really skilled. I've never heard anybody complain about, I can't get enough low light with the smaller camera. I can't get enough shallow depth of field with this. I don't hear that ever. It's only with, those that don't understand photography and you know you put it nicely you're like new photographers i'm like you know well i think that one of the problems they have is that the only thing that they're hearing coming from reviewers is this party line that every single person who picks up a micro four thirds camera has to say about every single review and that is the sensor is smaller so the depth of field isn't as good so that and the low light is good like that's like their sort of preface like this can't be as good as this because of these things and the point of the fact is that, or point of the matter in my mind, is that those things matter, but not as much as you might think. And these tools are more than good enough for any assignment you can throw at them. And maybe it's more important to look at some of the features and things that are in that camera that help you achieve content rather than just technical prowess. Um, you know, like that, this kind of where I'm at is like, um, you know, show me great content first. You know, tell me what features in the camera will get me better content, not just less grain, for example. Um, and this is coming from a guy who spends a ton of time with his micro four thirds cameras at 1600, 3200 and 6400. Like I am not afraid to take that camera up into those ISO ranges. I mean, with the technology we have today compared to where we were five years ago, it's ridiculous, you know? And then number two, you could add a little bit of noise reduction if it really bothers you. And three, nobody ever com thinks about it or even you know, <laughs> mentions it in the end. So you know, I did a video a while back. It was all about this. And I told people, you know, the first thing you have to do is get your photo in focus. You know, I don't care what <laughs> ISO you're using. I don't care right. what, you know, what you have to do. Like the first thing is your shutter speed needs to be high enough. Your focus needs to be on. If it's a sharp photograph, then your mind won't gravitate to the technical merits of the picture. It'll be looking at the image content. But, um, you know, like back when you know, uh, cameras came out years ago, film cameras, like it was actually simpler because you bought cameras based on their ability to solve problems in terms of content. Like one of the reasons you bought a Nikon F5 is because you needed the frame rate if you were shooting football, for example. Like it was the autofocus and the frame rate helped you achieve that. Now, Everybody's trying to buy their, uh, or at least YouTubers like to spend a lot of time thinking about, you need to buy this camera because it has as many megapixels in it, because this is in low light. And you are 100% on point that just because you can use low light doesn't make it good light. Like, one of the things that you have to do when you do my job, for example, is you have to spend a lot of time crafting light inside. And what I do is try and make that light, <clears throat> that light look natural at the same time so that it's not noticed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you're really trying to do is create beautiful light that doesn't look like it's like, oh my gosh, this this ballroom is a gymnasium, for example. Like that's that's the low hanging fruit, you know? And so is just like, okay, let's go outside and let me shoot this picture at 1.2 and there'll be no background. That's like the easiest, lowest uh, common denominator type of work, you know? And if you can elevate your game, you'll find more and more ways to kind of show your chops and show you what your sensibilities are in photography. You know, it's, it, you're, you're, you're saying all the right stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and send you that, that PayPal for that. Uh... Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, but you're saying all the right stuff, but these are also, Joseph, these are things that, that, are not sexy to talk about because they take effort and they take 
uh, uh, time and you have to be dedicated at least somewhat to be like, hmm, I want to go do low light. So what do I got to do to to make that, to make whatever I'm going to photograph look good? And you talked about intention. And you're talking about craft and thinking on photography, which is like, that is the most un-SEO thing you can search for as you put photography and thinking together. No one's looking for it. Um, you know, and yeah, maybe I'm being a smart ass because I'm being a smart ass, but at the same time, I think there's some truth to, to all that. So my, my thing is like, you have a YouTube channel. I want to talk about that next, but how, how are we as, as leaders in the photography world? And this also goes to my friends at Olympus and Panasonic that are listening. Um, my friends at Fuji that are listening. I don't have a lot of friends at Sony that listen cause you know, I'm not a, into their, but anyways, how do we educate people to say, look, you can, you can do all the things you want under, but you know, there's more to the camera than just, this one or two specs, um, because I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing that the, the YouTubers and the, the big reviewers are getting it. And part of me is like, well, maybe it's because they understand that that's not going to get the traction on YouTube. Um, but either way, at some point, I think we're going to start to see people shift and they're going to be like, you know, I actually want to take good photos and I don't just want to spend 8,000 bucks on a camera and a lens that is, you know, the size of a bazooka. And, you know, you know what I mean? So how do we educate people to value the important things about photography versus it's 24 megapixels and it was 20 megapixels last week? Uh, well, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I one of the things that I try to avoid doing on YouTube, for example, is doing product reviews. Like, just like, let me tell you all about this camera because there's six million of those out there. My more popular video is like, how do you set up your EM1 Mark II for doing this? Or how do you, what are the, some tips and tricks for how to set this up to do this, that, or the other? Or um, and whatnot. So I try and keep it in that vein. Um, one of the, you know, some of my more popular stuff has been on composition and stuff like that. Um, and I do think you're right. I do think there's always going to be two camps of people, but I think we can't discount the fact that there's a huge segment of people in the United States that are just gadget freaks and they're just into tech. Like that's just the way it's always going to be. And I think you have to separate that from people who want to take great photographs. Um, so I think sort of, I sort of think about it that way. I'm like, who am I collecting online in terms of who am I reaching or who am I teaching? Am I teaching somebody that wants to make great photographs or am I teaching somebody that just wants some affirmation that they made the right purchase? And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's fine. You know, like I said, it's like, um, you know, people are, can do whatever they want with their money. Right. Um, but I, you know, from my perspective, I think the best thing we can do is put out great work, you know, um, and I think that we can spend time explaining it and we can spend time uh, teaching people, you know, how we kind of come up with these stories and how these things play in our photographs. And so um, that's what I do in terms of wedding photography. When I teach and talk to people, it's like I'm talking about stories and I will tell stories. When people come in for consultations and then look at our work, I'm like, let me tell you the story behind this photograph, because then you're going to understand why all those pieces are there. Um, but YouTube and Instagram are, are just, they're behemoths. It's like trying to turn a, a, a mega yacht. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, a, it's a slow kind of turn. But one of the things that I really love about Olympus is that they really are uh, focused on features, you know, like, um, you haven't seen a lot from them over the years in terms of like, if you look at the image quality coming off an EM10 Mark three with a 16 megapixel sensor, which is probably the same one that was in the EM5 you know, years before that, all the way up through the 20 megapixel sensor that they have in the EM1X, like the sensor and the image quality, it's like, it's marginally different. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, but what are the, what do you, what are the reasons, what are the things you look at when you're buying Olympus cameras? It's like, what are you going to take pictures of? You know, and this one's got this out of focus and this one has this capability and things like that. And so what I love about what they're putting in their new models and what I see coming from them in terms of artificial intelligence and, and things like that and, and video and whatnot is that you're, what they're really concentrating there is on how can I improve this camera to make better photographs, to make it, pictures easier for people to make. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about them. They're not just shoving in a new sensor into the same body and going, look, this one's got 70 megapixels. So go buy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That stuff drives me nuts. I'm like 45 megapixels to 60. So what is that? 10% sharper? Maybe if you have the right lens, like, 
you know, it, it stuff drives me nuts. Like for me, being because I've been shooting since the '90s, like I want a camera that help, not only helps me do creative stuff that would take more time in post, but also uh, that is ergonomic, that helps me with the workflow. Because when you're managing, as you know, thousands and thousands of, of files, you know, you need to have something that has better workflow um, and make sure the camera doesn't stick me in hand. Like I tell everybody that asked me about this thing, this. <laughs> it's so oh, awesome. No. It's so awesome that the strap lug is, is up and not sticking me in the hands. Oh my God. Hold on. I'm having, I need a Shavasana moment here. Cause I'm just like, that is not like, uh, this revolutionary thing, but it is because I don't have a piece of metal sticking me in my freaking hand for 10 hours a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. At that point, I'm like, I'm just going to start with other cameras. I'm like, I just need to wear like a weightlifting glove or something. You know, but those are like the little things that I'm like, it's just, I love those refinements. And the, um, the, the idea of having more computational photography in cameras is cool. Um, I haven't used for more than like a couple minutes the EM1X. What is it in that that you're getting, even that you're not getting with the EM1 Mark II with the new firmware? What is it that you're like, oh, I'm going to take the EM1X out versus the EM1 Mark II? Um, for me, number one, it's probably, it's probably ergonomics is probably the best thing about it. Um, it, it has an autofocus joystick on the back of it oh, for moving right. the focus point around, which yeah. is a huge ergonomic sort of win. Um, not that using the screen on the back of the M1 Mark II didn't work relatively well, but speed wise, I find that the little nubbin works that much better. Um, but the, for me, it's, it was like you got the camera in your hand and it's up to your eye. Like the buttons and the size of the buttons and the tactile feel of the buttons is that much better. Um, they just kind of had a season to sort of refine all those things so that all of that can be done with my eye up to the camera that much easier. Um, other than that, you know, there are some advantages in terms of slow motion video. Um, there's, um, you know, live ND. Um, there's handheld high res. There's a, a number of things that are different. I don't think since the firmware upgrade, like what the firmware upgrade did is it made it less necessary for a larger number of people to look at the EM1X. But if you were a person who's putting, you know, and conservatively my cameras might get 300,000 frames a year on them, um, the durability of the shutter's higher, you know, things like that. Um, and then of course, having dual batteries in the camera just allows me to change batteries left often. So those all added up to wins for me in terms of the EM1X. Um, and again, like what the great part is, is that if you have an EM1 Mark II and you're looking at the M1X, you're like, well, I'm getting the same image quality. If this camera is delivering the pictures that I need, then I'm in good shape. So just so you guys know, don't buy used cameras from Joseph because you're going to get about half a million shutter actuations. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, people always get really uptight about that, too. They're like, I like, know it really just, doesn't even matter. And I'm like, dude, you can just send it to Olympus for 300 bucks. I'll put a new one in. Like, right. I do. I do that from time to time because it, they run out of end of life. It's like it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the camera. You just get another one. But, you know. So are you part of the Olympus Pro Advantage? I think it's Pro, Pro Advantage. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that whatever system of cameras that you use, if you're a person like me, it's, it always pays dividends in terms of speed and price and uh, loaners and all kinds of great stuff. So the experience has been pretty good then? Yeah, the only thing I've had so far is that uh, I had the hot shoes on my EM1 Mark IIs come loose because of the heavy speed lights and mm -hmm. just a lot of torquing on them. Sent them out on a Monday, had them back on a Thursday. No kidding. Yeah. Whoa. That's so, cool. I mean, that that's part of the thing that behind the scenes when I was working with uh, Panasonic and whatnot, I was always pushing them and other companies to really support the people that are making or living on it. Because it's like, if you got to send a camera, it's going to be gone for three weeks. Like, what are you going to do? You got to go rent now a camera for three weeks? You know, so it's, it's really cool that uh, you've, you've got a good experience with uh, Olympus in that regard. I also, <clears throat> excuse me, love the fact that you, what you mentioned about the EM1X was the ergonomics. Because when you when you know, when you're shooting for hours and hours and hours, man, that stuff really does wear you out. Um, I don't think a lot of photographers, based on what I'm not finding online, I don't think a lot of photographers are having conversations around their keeping their energy levels up and the other aspects of making the photo that you need to keep in consideration. If you're traveling and you plan on shooting a lot, you're not going to go wear your most uncomfortable shoes. Right. It's the same with your, 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 your gear, not just your cameras, but your laptops. You're not going to bring a giant 17 inch, you know, laptop. That's like an inch and a half thick and all this other, you don't bring that stuff, you know, better 
but then people will bring these giant cameras that are all just like, I mean, you finish your vacation. It's like you change your name to Quasimodo, wrap it up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I remember when I did hold the EM one X and I, cause I played with it recently in Seattle. I was like, this is like, it's almost sticking to my hand. It was really, really comfortable. Um, so I, I found you through your YouTube channel uh, primarily because of the videos you had mentioned, the the EM1 setup. I love the video you did on the, uh, I want to say it's the LS4 audio recorder. Yeah, and how yeah, it yeah. synchronizes. Um, I got to ask you about that because I'm like, hmm, I'm, I don't know a lot about audio. So what I do is I overpurchase <laughs> and I try to figure out what works and I give away what doesn't um, to people I don't like because if it doesn't work, I don't want to get to someone <laughs> I do like. Uh, so... Um, the LS1, you, are you using that successfully as a shotgun mic on top of your cameras? As in, in, yeah. In, you are? Yeah, so the, it's the LSP4. LSP4, uh, excuse me. The LS1 is the big one. Yeah, I use the LSP4, which is a smaller one. And it has a shotgun like uh, setting in there. So it has like three mics on top, and it's able to directionalize the um, yeah. the pickup. And, you know, for things that are you know up to 10 feet away, it does a really good job. Um and it's interesting because, um, you know, I didn't really realize this until I got into it with that recorder that, you know, any headphone jack is just a line out, right? So what you do is you can just run a line from the line out of the recorder and put it into the camera. And then essentially you're feeding the camera the, the output of the recorder. Um, at the same time, you're also getting the, the internal recording of the LSP4. It has internal memory, so that works great. Um, and then I also use it in a lavalier configuration. Uh, oftentimes, I will just stick it in a pocket of like a groom, run a little lav mic up to somebody's lapel, and then just use it that way. Um, and then third thing I'll do is that if I'm at an event and I need to record something and I need a backup, I'll use the LSP4. I'll put it in front of a speaker, and I'll just record what's coming out of the speaker straight up, uh, straight onto it using its uh, you know regular pickup pattern. So it winds up being a really, really flexible tool. Um, and, uh, you know, I really, um, think it works well, um, whether your camera has a microphone jack or doesn't have a microphone jack. Like one of the uh, challenges people have with like the EM10 Mark III, for example, is it doesn't have an input jack for a mic. So you could actually use this and then just sync them up in post. And, um, you know, any of the video editors these days, it couldn't get more simple. You could just drop the two tracks on, select them both and say synchronize and, you know, you're off to the races. So, um, I do think the LSP4 is a super, super flexible flexible tool when it comes to audio. I also have shotgun mics and whatnot and other things that I use for various uh, various reasons, but I always have that LSP4 in my bag because it's like the Swiss Army knife of audio <laughs> recorders. Right, and, and I think it outputs a, a, um, a sync tone. Uh, you can have an option to do that too, so you can sync it up even better in post, which uh, I actually did, I've been testing out doing video editing with Premiere Rush on my phone and my iPad, and you can't sync automatically so you got to look for the peak in the audio to to sync okay. up and it actually worked out good so i was like yeah. wow this is cool um okay cool I, I i feel better about about i mean i was i was digging the video already but there's only like three or four videos on that recorder yeah um that are worth watching actually so how did you start your youtube channel because that's so that's like really you know photo you can you can do photo you can totally geek out on there which is what I, i've gone on there and it's like you know, it's the end of the night, my brain has kind of gone away and I'm going to watch some of your videos and some of them go on for like 20 minutes and I dig them and kind of like, oh yeah, that's what the diamond means or whatever. <laughs> how, how, where, where did the inspiration come to, to start that channel? Cause it's not about weddings necessarily. Yeah. Um, well, you know, you know, being a wedding photographer, being a photographer in general can be a little bit of a lonely go at times, you know, like I work from home and I see clients all the time and whatnot, but it's not like working in an office, if you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. so one of the things about the YouTube channel was just connecting with other photographers that are doing similar things that I am. And the second reason I do it is just because, um, you know, after 18 years of doing this, I feel like I'm ready to start teaching some. And so that's been really fun. And then the third thing is just that when I was moving into the Olympus system, like one of the things that's amazing about Olympus cameras is they are, have got to be the most configurable cameras on the market. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, um, you know, 
it's a Rubik's cube of options that you have in terms of how you can set it up. And so I thought that you know, a lot of people would benefit from understanding some of the nuances in terms of the way that I set it up. And it turns out that there's a huge community of people out there that are just looking for tips and tricks and hints and things like that in terms of how to make their life easier with their with their cameras. And it's a fairly small community. I, you know, it's kind of a boutique kind of community in terms of Olympus and Panasonic users. And I found them all to be a, a hugely welcoming crowd for the most part, you know, it's, it's really been great to get to know them and, and share experiences with them. Yeah, just don't go to like a Nikon event and take your camera out like, hey! Yeah, that's when you're glad it's light because you can run out of there when they, <laughs> when they come chasing you. So it sounds, it sounds like you have a lot of fun making the videos. Uh, I mean, I could tell in the videos that you do and uh, can, the commenters love it. Uh, you, you had mentioned a few times about teaching. So when you say teaching, are you talking about teaching through YouTube only or are you – doing in-person educational events? Yeah, I've done one-on-one -on -one mentorships for a long time because I've just had wedding photographers come to me over the years to kind of get some advice and take some, you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one sort of time to learn some things. Um, but I'm really interested in doing YouTube learning and doing YouTube live. And so what I'm planning over the next, you know, few months is to kind of um, have Q&As and, and live shooting sessions so that I can kind of uh, teach that way. Um, I love the uh, aspect of that in the sense that it can be replayed after the after the event. And I enjoy watching behind the scenes and, and hearing other people's questions when I see those things done. So that's kind of the direction that I kind of want to move in. I see. So mainly, mainly online education as opposed to like in person then? Yeah. I mean, if we if we wanted to do a workshop, I probably would, would look closely at it if I ever if I get the opportunity. But um, you know, I generally speaking, it, I there's so many online, um, I mean, in person workshops for wedding photographers these days that um, you know I think that there's tons and tons and tons of great education out there, and I'm not certain what it was, what it is that I would add to that story. But when it comes to teaching amateurs and teaching enthusiasts and teaching parents how to take photographs, that's where I think that there's a lot of room and space to grow. So those are the kind of people that I enjoy talking to the most. Yeah, it's fun to see people that don't have so much experience get excited about photography as opposed to if you're teaching somebody who's got a bunch of old bad habits and they're kind of like arguing, they're ready to fight. You're like, ah, I want to have some fun with, with cameras. Um Awesome, man. We've been on uh, a good amount of time. I could totally chat with you more. And I'm just thinking, you know, uh, hopefully you come to Austin soon or maybe I'll end up in Dallas. And never, you never know. Um, and be cool to maybe organize a photo walk or something. But in the meantime, should we send people that are listening to your YouTube channel? Is that where you want people to go? Yeah, absolutely. And you, uh, I think you've got the link to that, but I think it's just my name with photographer at the end. So <laughs> nothing too difficult, but yeah, love to have you guys out there. Love to have your comments and, and all kind of good stuff. And I try to respond to as many as humanly possible. Yeah. That's really cool that, that you do comment on respond to actual to people so much. Um, so yeah, everybody go to check out Joseph's uh, work on his YouTube channel. It's a lot of fun and I'm just going to put any other links in there for your Instagram or wherever else you want people uh, to go to. Man, it's been awesome. I, went, the time went by so quick. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, I got so much more to talk about. So we'll have to have you come back on, or maybe when you're doing your live things, if you want to chat on your channel, I'll come on your channel too. Cool. Very much. Love it. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, you bet. Talk to you soon.